Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back yet again to the Siege of Vrax. Last episode, we looked at the opening moves of the siege itself, along with the Imperial 88th Siege Army's initial positioning. Now that they've had a first taste of the Vraxian defenses, it had become unfortunately clear that things weren't going to work out quite as easily as Imperial Guard Headquarters had first anticipated. The opening offensive launch by the 149th, 143rd, and 150th Regiments had been utterly repulsed with considerable casualties, and to add insult to injury, the traitors had then launched their own counterattack upon the Krieg lines and gained more ground than the Imperial Guard had in two days. Seemingly somewhat paralyzed from this turn of event, Imperial Guard headquarters remained quiet about any further offensive operations for quite some time, leaving the Krieg commanders to do what they did best, beginning a long, drawn-out war of attrition against the Vraxian traitors. But what exactly was it that stopped the Imperial Guard offensive in its tracks so thoroughly? I've talked in vague terms about the Vraxian defenses before, but it's time to really give you a good idea of exactly what the 88th Siege Army was up against. As mentioned previously, the defenses on Vrax had been built over a very, very long time by various planetary governors, who often viewed the extension and construction of new defensive works as a sort of prestige project to further protect the planet of Vrax and its vast Munitorum stockpiles of vehicles, munitions, and general supplies. This attitude, obviously encouraged by the Adeptus Munitorum, led to extensive defensive works, and not without a reason, mind you. There are plenty of creatures out there in the galaxy with a wide variety of extremities that would love to get their claws, tentacles, hands, paws, or whatever else they might have on the supplies on Vrax. Thusly, this was not the first time it had been assaulted by external forces. And so this mix of personal prestige and a very real and tangible threat led to the defenses becoming what they were now, that the 88th Siege Army was placed opposite them. First and foremost, the outermost lines could be, in very rough terms, compared to those of the Krieg regiments. They were meant originally to be improvised defensive works, providing essentially an outer screen for the far more valuable defenses behind it. But since these defenses had been re-engineered, reconstructed, and upgraded over the course of literal decades or even centuries in a few cases of the innermost lines, they had gone far beyond their humble origins of simple earthen slit trenches. These days, pretty much every single trench on Vrax was constructed out of permacrete, with firing step, shelters, dugouts, and grenade defenses. They also had fortified resistance nests all along the front line. These are things like armored cupolas, in which a heavy bolter could be placed, or in some cases, even heavy weapons like cannons, mortars, or even flamethrowers. Additionally, these forward defenses were also protected by, in some cases, literal kilometers worth of barbed wire. Of course, most of that would be rendered ineffective by good old-fashioned mass bombardment, but still, it was a way of slowing down any potential advance. And, naturally, considerable quantities of mines. Of course, the Imperium used to know where exactly these mines were placed, because as an Imperial world, they were required to give this information to the Adeptus Administratum, just in case friendly forces had to operate in the theatre without contact to the defenders. You wouldn't want them bullandering into minefields, after all. But since the planet had now somewhat changed its colours, it had been assumed that most of these mines, if not indeed all of them, had been dug up and replaced, so the old Imperial maps probably weren't particularly useful. There was also the small problem of vast quantities of mines actually being stored, in the Vraxian armories themselves. The outer defences were essentially a constant battle between the Vraxian engineers and the Krieg engineers. 
removing and relaying mines and barbed wire continuously to clear and block paths of advances. But assuming the Kree guardsmen managed to get past these outer defenses, they would run into the actual defensive line behind that, a vast intricate network of bunkers and heavy gun emplacements, all connected by further permacrete trenches and interlocking fields of fire. The bunkers also contain a wide variety of heavy weapons. Flamethrowers, mortars, heavy bolters, last cannons, rocket launchers, fragmentation cannons, and even, in some cases, outright battle cannons and heavy tank weaponry. And of course, every inch of both the defensive bunker line and the preceding screening line has been pre-targeted by the heavy guns situated behind the bunkers. Huge quantities of earth shakers, medusas, quad launchers, mortars, and various heavy siege guns. And all of these weapons are guided and directed by fire coordinators in permanent concrete bunkers. They have, long before the war started, pre-plotted the entirety of the battlefield in front of them, including the screening lines and the trenches, meaning that they can direct heavy bombardment fire towards any single point of the front line by giving out pre-designed grid coordinates. Every single battery will have these grid coordinates pre-aimed, which means that they have a logbook, essentially, with the written coordinates, the elevation and the angle, etc. for every single gun in the battery to allow it to hit that precise area. This means that should any small portion of the Krieg offensive upon the trenches stall even for just a few minutes, then the fire directors in the Raxian trenches can identify this and accurately guide the guns onto the area in question within minutes. And without constructed underground shelters to hide in, that would certainly mean the immediate annihilation of the Krieg troopers. And as if all of that wasn't bad enough, all of these defenses, the outer screening line, the bunker line, and the artillery positions, are all themselves in a way screens for the true core of the defenses. Vast fortress complexes, star forts, and flak towers, boasting huge quantities of heavy artillery, anti-tank, and anti-personnel weapons, along with massive barracks quarters able to house tens of thousands of troops in virtually complete and utter safety from even the heaviest of bombardments. These fortress complexes could rightfully be considered the heart of the defensive lines. This is where the enemy would marshal their counterattacks in underground fortified complexes and also the positions they would fall back to in case the Death Corps managed to penetrate their outer defenses. Since of course the fortress complexes were themselves formidable defensive positions. The forts had almost all been constructed from ancient template patterns and were highly effective. Naturally, this meant that the attacking loyalists knew exactly what they were up against, but knowing and doing anything about it are two very different things. Each complex was constructed from multiple layers of individual standalone defensive lines and positions, all created to be unidirectional and covered by heavy automatic weapons placed further inside the complex. This meant that any position captured by the attacker would be worse than worthless from a defensive point of view, as it would provide little to zero cover and would in fact serve merely to expose the attackers to yet more effective fire from the defenders. To give you a general idea of the kind of setup I'm talking about, let's have a look at a fairly simple unidirectional trench. In this case, you can see that the trench is deep enough for a soldier to walk upright alongside it. He also has a firing step he can step onto, and that will allow him to fire over the lip of the trench. However, if the trench is occupied by assaulting forces, then the opposite side of the trench is a steep incline, which provides absolutely nothing in the ways of cover for the attacker, and allows the defender, with a heightened position deep within the complex, to simply sweep the trenches clear with heavy automatic fire. Another form of defense denial, which is used relatively sparingly, is high explosive devices built into the heavier bunker complexes, allowing, for example, a fortified bunker to be blown up from a command center deeper within the fortified complex, 
This is of course an option used fairly sparingly since once the bunker has been exploded, it's not going to be useful anymore for the defenders either, but it is a good way of dislodging a particularly troublesome group of Imperials. And now that you know all of this, I'm sure you can fully appreciate just how formidable the Varaxian defenses actually were. And of course, there were three of these defensive lines, with each one of them becoming incrementally tougher and tougher and tougher the closer the attack had come to the final Vraxian citadel at the heart of the defences. All in all, it was a small wonder that the initial offensive operation did not work out quite as planned. If anything, one can begin to question the sheer ludicrous levels of optimism that Imperial High Command must have felt when they thought that breaking through the outermost defensive line would be easy. Though, to be fair, Imperial Headquarters was working under the assumption that the Rebels would not have finished their defences, which sounds like a rather optimistic way of thinking to me, but oh well. This was Lord Commander Zhulka's first campaign after all, so perhaps such an obvious mistake might be forgivable. Although, the consequences of said mistake were also equally irreversible. But after said failure, whether it be excusable or not, Imperial Headquarters took a somewhat more hands-off approach to things, which allowed the Death Court of Krieg to do their thing. And whilst their strategy might certainly be slow, and might certainly also be somewhat expensive in terms of manpower, it is undoubtedly effective. To an outsider, someone unaware of how the Death Corps does things, it might look as if they were simply just hurling men at the defences, with no real long-term aim or overreaching plan, but nothing could be further from the truth. Because whilst it might be an easy mistake to make, it would be utterly unforgivable to confuse the cold, calculated attrition of the Death Corps with the berserk, furious charges favoured by the brainless followers of the Ruinous Gods. The Death Corps were not simply throwing men away, they were expending them, like currency or munitions. They might purchase the location of an enemy bunker with the lives of a squad, then destroy the bunker with artillery. Or they might sell the lives of a hundred guardsmen in return for the destruction of a permacrete trench, using the debt packs the guardsmen were carrying. In this way, slowly but surely, the enemy's defences were tested again and again, weakened again and again, until finally the Death Corps found the weakness they had been looking for. Ironically, the weakness was to be a fortress. Where before the Imperial Headquarters had targeted a perceived weakness and found unyielding steel, the Death Corps had targeted a perceived strength and found soft, yielding mud. Although it sure as hell didn't look like mud to begin with. The 9th Company of the 261st Regiment of the 30th Lion Corps was tasked with capturing Fort A453, a major defensive position in the sector assigned to the 30th Lion Corps. This fort was one of several objectives that was to be captured in the first major offensive operation of the 30th Lion Corps since their defeat during the very first Imperial Offensive on Vrax. That was over six months ago at this point, and the 30th Lion Corps had spent that time probing the enemy's defences and biding its time, launching no major offensives, although it kept its strategic reserves ready in case they got lucky with a probe. They didn't, however, but now they had regained their full strength and a little bit extra. They had been seconded, the 19th Bombardment Corps, to aid them in their own localised offensive. The goal of this offensive was relatively limited, it was to get a solid foothold in the enemy's front line that could maybe be expanded upon with further attacks, and Fort A453 was one of the objectives for this foothold. 
It had been deemed relatively unlikely that the fortress could be captured successfully, but the potential benefits to the Death Corps, if it were to be captured, were deemed to be significant enough that they should at the very least try. A453 was a pillbox and bunker complex, not one of the massive fortresses of the rearward lines, but formidable nonetheless. Its primary weapon, an Earthshaker cannon housed in an armoured redoubt, had been taken out during a previous bombardment by a lucky bombard shell, but the position itself and its surrounding network of bunkers remained almost entirely intact. The fort was protected by a deep anti-tank ditch, along with several lines of razor wire and minefields. This area was overlooked by several small bunkers and resistance nests equipped with heavy bolters, heavy stubbers, and autocannons. Any attacker would first have to cross the ditch, then the barbed wire, then the minefield, and then defeat the outlying bunkers before they could finally make an assault on the pillbox complex itself, which of course was by no means incapable of defending itself, possessing dozens of heavy bolters with interlocking fields of fire and even a few light mortar emplacements. And finally, perhaps the biggest asset of this particular fortress was its connection to a secondary line about half a kilometre deeper within the first defensive line. This connection took the form of a permacrete trench that ran underground, meaning that reinforcements from this secondary line could flow to the fortress completely undisturbed by even the heaviest blocking barrages. It was, by all accounts, a very solid position, and previous attempts to take it had been repulsed very easily and very bloodily. Krieg High Command was not overly optimistic about the 9th Company's chances, but, as previously mentioned, the potential rewards were simply just too good to ignore. Captain Tybalk of the 9th Company oversaw the final preparations of his men leading up to the assault. There would be a preparatory bombardment before the offensive, and there would also be a quick drumfire bombardment of the positions before his men would attack. His company had also been provided with the support of an additional battery of short-range thud guns to engage the enemy's fortifications over open sites. The gun were meant to ensure that anyone in the enemy's pillboxes would think twice about poking their heads out and firing their heavy weapons and along with the thud guns, a new offensive sap had also been constructed. This would reduce the distance that the 9th Company would have to cover to only a couple hundred meters, after which the company would reach the relative safety of the enemy's anti-tank ditch. And these preparations were to prove successful. Captain Tybalk's lead squads, including himself and his command squad, reached the razor wire in front of the anti-tank ditch, having taken only mild fire from the enemy's defences. They managed to cut their way through the razor wire using bolt cutters and get into the relative safety of the anti-tank ditch, whilst the following squads of the 9th Company were pinned down by ever-increasing firepower from the pillbox complex. After this, the captain and his men pushed forward into the minefields in front of the outlying pillbox complex, still under fire from their heavy bolters. The company began taking very heavy casualties, as the lead elements were running straight into a minefield which the artillery had failed to clear, and the trailing elements were placed under ever heavier bolter fire. Despite this, the captain pushed onwards. Displaying the kind of ruthless determination and bravery in the face of death that the Corps is so justly famed for. The lead squads began their assault on the outlying pillboxes, tossing frag grenades through firing slits and blasting open armoured doors with dead packs. Unfortunately, bravery alone is no shield against bullets, and Tybalk took a near crippling injury to the leg. The momentum slowed, and it appeared inevitable that the 9th Company's valiant efforts would end much like the company who had attacked Fort A453 before them. But fortune is a fickle mistress, and never more so than in times of war. The fortification commander had gotten complacent after six months of quiet, and clearly had not expected an escalation of this nature. Neither had his men. 
As the Vraxian defenders emerged from their underground redoubts, they were immediately faced with Krieg guardsmen already assaulting their positions. Some threw themselves into the fighting, launching counterattacks out of their trenches in a bid to push the guardsmen back off the pillboxes. But many others, emerging into the early dawn light, panicked, assumed the pillbox was already lost, and began a headlong flight back down the communication trenches. This spread further terror and confusion, and suddenly, just like that, the Vraxian defenders were in full panic mode. A raging melee was now taking place outside, and thinking the assault had failed, some wise commander in the Krieg rear lines ordered a battery of quad launchers to resume their bombardment to catch the traitors in the open. The ensuing hailstorm of shrapnel yet further increased the confusion, and wounded Captain Tyrebok once again. But in all of the confusion and the panic amongst the Vraxian defenders, the captain and his command squad managed to gain entry into the pillbox. They were now inside the complex itself, and many agonizing minutes then passed as they expected a massed counterattack to drive them back out again, but since the Vraxian defenders were busy running around like headless chickens, it never materialized. Seeing his chance, he sent a communication back to the frontline trenches with a runner, quoting, 9th Company within wire. Enemy numbers growing in strength will hold if reinforced. And with this message sent, he and his command squad, now reinforced by other elements of various other squads, began pushing into the complex. Over the course of the next hour, they turned another pillbox into a smoking ruin with flamethrower fire, and blasted their way into one of the underground shelters using melter charges. They had managed to gain entry to the main galleries beneath Fort A453. The enemy had thrown up hastily erected barricades, which the captain ordered to be charged with lowered bayonets, where Tybalk took a third wound to the head this time, with his now shattered helmet barely saving his life. Now embroiled in the half-illuminated corridors beneath the fortress, Krieg bayonets reflected the artificial light of the lumen tubes as charge after charge saw them covered in traitor blood. The Ninth Company succeeded in killing or driving out the remaining traitors, securing the lower levels just in time, as the fleeing traitors, thinking their position lost, called down their own heavy artillery upon the fort. This finally ended the battle for the time being. Deep beneath the ground in the enemy's own fortifications, Tybalk and his guardsmen were safe for the time being. The traitors themselves were also seeking shelter, and the battle ceased for the remainder of the barrage. This, of course, left Captain Tybalk in a somewhat precarious position. He and his men were safe from the bombardment going on above ground, but they were now trapped, essentially, quite deep inside enemy lines, and the enemy would only stay quiet for as long as the bombardment continued. After that, it was anybody's guess what was about to happen, but it would, in all due likelihood, include vast quantities of traitor soldiers bearing down upon their position. Additionally, they had no clue whether or not the captain's runner had actually made it back to the Krieg lines, and whether or not reinforcements were on their way. All they could do was hunker down, gather up what ammunition they had left, and prepare to defend their positions to the last guardsman. Fortunately for the survivors, the captain's messenger had indeed reached the rear lines. It had taken him many hours to do so, and he had been wounded twice in the process, but finally he made it to the Krieg trench lines, where he was brought before General Dujan of the 219th and delivered his report, informing the general that a contingent of Krieg guardsmen had made it into the fort and were now holding positions inside the fort. This was the chink in the enemy's armor that they had been looking for all this time but the window to exploit it was closing quickly. The captain only had so many men, and he was in the middle of the enemy's defenses. Doubtlessly, once they realized they were cut off, but still lodged within the fort, they would launch massive counterattacks to wipe out him and his men. The general would have to act quickly. 
First and foremost, he had to ensure that the enemy's reserves could not be sent into this battle easily. To achieve this, he sent a communique up to 30th Lion Corps headquarters and requested an immediate general offensive along the entirety of the 30th Lion Corps sector. Within hours, hundreds of thousands of Kriegsguardsmen and tens of thousands of artillery pieces would be turning the previously so quiet frontline into an inferno of hell and fury. Secondly, the General requested the continued aid of the 19th Bombardment Corps along with several artillery detachments. They would lay down a murderous heavy artillery fire to block off any further large-scale enemy reinforcements. If the Vraxians wanted to reinforce their forward positions, they would have to do so through the single underground access route under Fort A453, severely limiting the amount of men and material they could transport to the front. And finally, he needed a breakthrough force. He already had combat engineers and grenadier formations under his command, which would be sent into battle immediately the next day. But he required something more mobile. If this truly was a break in the enemy's front line, it would need to be exploited. The grenadiers and the engineers could secure it, but only the assault corps had the mobility to truly make it worth something. The Rapid Reaction Forces were immediately mobilized, and three companies of the 61st Tank Regiments began their journey to the front lines. They would require a full day to move up and would so arrive on the battle's third day. And finally, the 8th Assault Corps was ordered to fully mobilize and stand ready to exploit any breakthroughs that might come from this. Meanwhile, the 9th Company and its captain remained blissfully, or in this case, I suppose it would be woefully unaware of these events. They could not be sure that reinforcements were coming, or if the runner had even reached their own lines. But it is not in the nature of a true Krieg Guardsman to ever worry over much about the feeling of despair. A sacrifice is still a sacrifice, even if no one is there to take notice of it. And of course, to make the ultimate sacrifice in the Emperor's service is the greatest honor any member of the Death Corps could ever aspire to. And so they are resolved to continue the fight, regardless of whether or not reinforcements would be coming. And whilst it was unsure whether or not reinforcements were on their way, the enemy most definitively was. Because they were under no illusions what this could possibly mean. One of their linchpin defenses had been infiltrated by the enemy in force, and they were now holding their own defenses against them. If they could not root them out quickly, they would be reinforced. And once the vast numerical superiority of the 88th Siege Army started pouring in through the gap, there was precious little the Vraxian defenders could do to stem the flow. The Kriegsguardsmen would have to be evicted from A453 immediately, regardless of the cost. Unfortunately, the defenders of this particular sector had already proven themselves hesitant when it came to making real sacrifices. That was the reason why the defenders were in this pickle in the first place. As part of their reinforcements, they would also receive new contingents of enforcers to ensure that this time the defenders were fully aware of what was at stake and also to make doubly sure that there would be no repeat occurrence of the shameful and premature withdrawal that had initiated the battle. And this particular point would be reinforced with violence if necessary. With the arrival of the enforcers, the option of retreating had been taken well and truly off the table, meaning that Captain Tybork and his men were in for one hell of a fight. They had managed to secure the lower levels of the fort, which would give them some advantages. The most important of which was that they knew exactly where the enemy would be coming from. There were some enemy troops still located within the fort, but the lower levels had been essentially completely cleared out. As such, there would only be a small number of troops that could strike the Kriegsmen from behind. 
This in turn meant that the enemy's main force would have to come through the single underground tunnel connecting Fort A453 to the rear lines. This of course also meant that the main enemy force would have to come down a fairly narrow corridor and wander straight into the fire of what remained of the 9th Company. At the very least, the Raxians could thank their lucky star that the 9th Company was never actually supposed to get this far in the first place, and so had been issued with very little in the way of proper heavy weapons. No heavy bolters, stubbers, autocannons, and only a few flamers, of which Captain Tybork had none. Instead, he would have to rely almost entirely on the number 98 Lucius Pattern Lasgun, a weapon not exactly ideally suited to this kind of operations. Seeing as the number 98, whilst exceedingly accurate and packing one hell of a punch, only had access to a semi-automatic firing mode. Which, whilst it would certainly help conserve ammunition, something that to be fair was rather tight at the moment, when you're being charged by potentially hundreds of traitorous lunatics, you might be forgiven for wanting a slightly higher rate of fire. Fortunately, or well, I suppose that depends upon your point of view, this particular problem, quote unquote, was solved in a rather quick and irrefusable fashion, as the 9th Company quickly and simply ran out of Lasgun ammunition, and being underground as they were, without any kindling or means of making a fire, they had no way of recharging their Lasgun packs. This left the Krieg Guardsmen with no choice but to start using their enemies' weapons against them, and the traitors' weapons consisted overwhelmingly of relatively primitive auto guns, solid slug automatic rifles. On the bright side, this provided the Death Corps with the automatic firing capabilities that they certainly wanted at this particular point in time. The downside was that they were now using often poorly maintained and frankly, almost antiquated PDF-grade weaponry, which had a nasty habit of breaking down rather frequently when used over-enthusiastically, and considering they were being used to stop thousands of charging, screaming lunatics, over-enthusiastic usage was somewhat unavoidable. The rifles would be fired on full auto until the battles literally began to glow cherry red and eventually became so warped they became next to useless, at which point the guardsmen in question would have to go looking for a new weapon, a not entirely unproblematic proposal in and of itself. On the second day of fighting, the problem wasn't yet too pronounced, as there were plenty of weapons and ammunition simply just lying around, byproducts of the fierce fighting required to take the sublevels in the first place. But at the end of the second day and the beginning of the third, all of those weapons and all of that ammunition was spent. The only source of replacement rifles and bullets now were the ones carried by the screaming hordes charging straight towards them down the narrow passageway. Every subsequent time the enemy now charged, the valiant defenders of the 9th Company would have to cut them down swiftly and economically whilst also allowing them to get just close enough to ensure that when the enemy was killed, the defenders could leap out of their defensive positions, rush forward to the slain enemy, steal their weapons and ammunition, and rush back again before the next wave hit. Life underground was most certainly quite hectic for Captain Tyborg and his men, but life above ground wasn't all that much better. The traitors knew that they had a breach in their front line. They also knew that the breach in question was stubbornly refusing to simply just die, and so they were continuously plastering what remained of Fort A453 with heavy artillery fire in the hopes that that would prevent the Death Corps from sending in yet further reinforcements. Of course, heavy artillery fire as a light rain shower to the Death Corps of Krieg, although granted somewhat more lethal and several teams of combat engineers and grenadiers were making their way deeper into the fort, 
knocking out the remaining pillboxes, overrunning bunkers, and forcing their way deeper and deeper underground. These elite troops had been sent in at the dawn of the second day, but were making fairly slow progress. The traitors, who had broken and run just the previous day, were now painfully aware of the fact that there was no retreat. Underground, Captain Tybork and his men were blocking the only underground retreat path, and going overground was sheer suicide. Not only would they have to brave their own heavy artillery, but then they would have to crawl half a kilometer through the Krieg artillery's blocking barrage. And by the time that night fell on the second day, most of the remaining traitor defenders in the fort had been subdued. Unfortunately, Captain Tybork and his men were also on the verge of suffering the exact same fate. Attrition may be the favoured tool of the Death Corps of Krieg, but they are not immune to it themselves. Every time the traitors charged down the passageway, they got a little bit closer. Every time they charged, they expended a little bit more Death Corps ammunition, and every time they charge, they might wound or even kill yet another defender. At some point during the second day, Tybork realized that holding the access tunnel was no longer feasible. He was being assaulted by overwhelming forces, and the position, although defensible, was far from ideal. He abandoned the access tunnel and began to retreat deeper into the underground fortress structures. This allowed the enemy to reinforce through the access tunnel, but it allowed the captain and his remaining men, now down to a mere 16 guardsmen, to take up more advantageous defensive positions. This also allowed the traitors to reinforce their front lines. But at this point, the engineers and grenadiers were well and truly past the wire, fighting the traitors in hand-to-hand -hand combat through the galleries of the fortress. And whilst the traitors might have been able to offer more than adequate resistance when manning prepared positions fighting against an enemy in the open, now that they were locked in close quarters combat with the Death Corps' assault specialists, they were falling like wheat before the scythe. Using melter charges, they quickly gained entry into the lower galleries and began clearing them as well. At nightfall of the second day, they had gained access of the main access corridor that Captain Tybork and his men had so recently abandoned. And this time, when the traitors came charging down the corridor, they were not met with a desultory spatter of small arms fire. No, this time they were charging face first into flamers, heavy stubbers, and a hellgun fire. And even the Cardinal's enforcers could not force them to do so for long. Realizing that retaking the fort through this access corridor was futile, these attacks were soon called off. The traitors still had hundreds, perhaps even a thousand or so men inside the fort itself. Perhaps the Raxian defenders thought that they might still be able to swing some miracle if they could at the very least block any further enemy reinforcements. As such, on the dawn of the third day, they initiated large-scale counterattacks against Fort A453, both from the flanks and the line connected to Fort A453 via the underground tunnel. It should come as no surprise that it is considerably easier to retake a fortress than it is to capture it in the first place. Most of its heavy weapons will have been damaged or outright destroyed, and of course most of its defenses will be facing outwards, not backwards towards the rear lines. Of course, the attackers would have to make it through the Krieg blocking barrage, but that was no different than what the Krieg's guardsmen had to do to attack the fort in the first place. And these counterattacks had proven extremely effective during the opening offensive of the siege. This time, however, they were not able to react quite quickly enough. By the dawn of the third day, the three companies of the 61st Tank Regiment had arrived, along with an additional bonus, a Baneblade Super Heavy Tank. These forces were immediately thrown into the battle, along with the Trojan Engineer vehicles sent forward to fill up the anti-tank trenches. 
In addition to these armored reinforcements, the entirety of the 30th Line Corps began a general escalation on their offensive operations. The entirety of the Lion Corps was now throwing itself with considerable abandon at the enemy's lines, pouring yet more men, materiel, engineers, grenadiers, and armored reserves, as well as bombardment corps and detached artillery formations into the fight, in an effort to push the Vraxian reserves beyond breaking point. And the strategy was working. The counterattacks had some limited success, but they did not carry with them the weight needed to dislodge the Grenadiers and Guardsmen now occupying Fort A453. At around midday, the last overground bunker still occupied by the traitors were crushed beneath the Bane Blade's massive bulk. With the last of the enemy's fortifications dealt with, the Super Heavy Tank and its smaller armored cousins were now free to begin blasting apart the enemy's counterattack, forcing it quite swiftly, to stall out. Underground, the battle had also turned decisively in the Death Corps' favor. The Grenadiers had cleared out almost the entirety of the fort, and were wheedling out the last few pockets of resistance as the tanks above were crushing the last few enemy defenses. The Grenadiers were just about ready to begin clearing out yet another gallery with grenades and flamethrowers when they heard the unmistakable sound of orders being snapped out in rapid and precise order in Krieg battle cards. A few tense moments followed as the two sides confirmed one another's identity. The Grenadiers had happened upon Captain Tybork and the last of his surviving guardsmen. They had been saved by a capture of Raxian Flamer, liberated from their enemies during one of their swift raids to gather more ammunition and weaponry. Its repeated spurts of blazing Prometheum had barred the entrance to their gallery for just long enough for the Grenadiers to reach them. A little while later, after some cursory medical attention, Captain Tybork and what remained of the lead elements of the 9th Company emerged into the sunlight surrounded by the ruins of Fort A453. There were eight wounded guardsmen. Carrying broken LAS rifles and bloodied entrenchment tools, they supported their captain, whom had been wounded in both legs, his right arm, abdomen, and head. Still clutched in their heroic captain's hand was the flamer who had saved their lives, and its now empty fuel canister. Against all expectations, the 9th Company, much reduced though it was, had achieved their objective. Not without a little help, but nevertheless, Fort A453 had been taken. The break that the Death Court had been looking for for the last six months had been found, and in the most unlikely of locations. But at the end of the day, it was not important where it happened, all that mattered was that it had happened. Now the 30th Lion Corps could pour through the gap in an unstoppable wave, and with the door now officially open, the 8th Assault Corps was also fully mobilized and sent to the front, both to begin the headlong rush towards the 2nd defensive line and also to aid in widening the breach. To further speed the collapse of the 1st Defensive Line, the 12th Line Corps, along with the 34th Line Corps, also began throwing themselves against the defenses opposing them. Knowing that if the enemy had any sense, they would realize that now that their efforts to retake Ford A453 had irreversibly failed, they would have to retreat to the 2nd Defensive Line, and quickly, or risk encirclement and annihilation. The 88th Siege Army, however, was of course not particularly keen on allowing the enemy to do so, and so they initiated large-scale escalations all along the front line, forcing the enemy to place considerable rearguards and fight a continuous battle whilst also withdrawing from the first line. With any luck, there might even be further breakthroughs up and down the line occupied by the 12th and 34th Line Corps. 
if the 88th Army was particularly lucky, these minor breakthroughs might allow them to pour yet further assault corps and tank regiments through the gaps and encircle and destroy the enemy piecemeal. And it would appear as if the 88th Siege Army was indeed in luck. The enemy had mostly abandoned their positions, apparently fleeing head over heels with only minor rearguard actions. Swiftly, both the 12th and 34th secured multiple new breaches and began pushing through their own lines heading towards the second defensive line. If this continued, they might even be able to continue the route of the enemy all the way into the second line, overrunning it swiftly and therefore hopefully making up for the lost time. The first line had been broken, yes, but it was a solid year behind schedule. And Imperial Guard High Command, in their infinite wisdom, had already dismissed any possibility of the traitors launching a riposte, and so simply threw caution to the wind and ordered a large-scale general advance, including the infantry, the supporting artillery, and of course the assault corps, to attempt to chase down as many of the enemy's forces as imperially possible. Now was the time for the Death Corps of Krieg to surge forward and make up for the lost time, and perhaps even more importantly, to make up for the somewhat exuberant expenditure of soldiers. The breakthrough had required a general escalation on behalf of not just the 30th Line Corps, but the 12th and also the 34th. Now, the latter two Line Corps had been against weakened opposition, to be sure, but nevertheless, three whole Line Corps had been thrown into the fighting on short notice, with somewhat inadequate preparations, as, once again, nobody had actually expected this operation to actually turn into a general offensive. But, of course, as we all know, at the end of the day, the only thing that truly matters is results. As long as this attack was pushed forward with the appropriate levels of reckless abandon and the second line was overcome swiftly, there was every chance that not only could the time loss and casualties be made up for, but perhaps this was even a golden opportunity to push the entire plan a bit ahead of schedule. General Zhukov was overjoyed and made sure to reinforce the notion amongst the Death Corps commanders that this was the time for them to make amends for their failure earlier during the campaign. As for what happened next after the Lord Commander so suitably encouraged his commanders, well, you're going to have to wait until the next video to find that one out. Until then, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much so for watching the Siege of Vrax, and if you enjoyed it, please do consider sharing it around to friends and websites, etc. Whatever you can think of, it really does help. Until next time, have a good day.